It's always nothing. It's always nothing. When am I getting paid? It's always nothing. Hello, welcome back to the recap. My name is Angie. This is my husband Tim. Mari's over here, and today we are recapping from the couple's retreat. This is the mansion Airbnb of former NFL star Von Miller. We're here because apparently anyone can be here. They just show up and they're allowed. Yeah, you don't even have to be in a couple to go to couples retreat. I mean, they already paid the bill. <laughs> That's true. This is the place where everyone was doing yoga. Mm -hmm. um, for announcements, sorry for the scarcity of videos. I work more hours now, and when I get home, I usually want to relax or, you know, do some chore that I'm behind on. Um, but lately, I got an itch to do recaps again. So here we are. I'm obviously reviewing Married at First Sight. This is my first review of something that is not Sister Wives related. For the longest time, I didn't want to recap other shows because my knowledge of them compared to Sister Wives is deficient in comparison. I wouldn't say deficient, it's just not as ludicrously in-depth. Yeah, I like to say that if one received academic degrees for the reality TV shows they consume, I'd probably have a PhD in Sister Wives, and I would have barely graduated middle school with Married at First Sight. Just to give you an idea of the level of where I'm at with this franchise, in the past, I had this mindset that if I'm not an expert in something, I shouldn't speak about it. But I do have strong opinions of what's going on this season, so I figured I'd talk about them. Fair enough. If you couldn't tell, I haven't watched every season of MAFS. I've watched a little bit of season 7 through 10, and I watched the entirety of seasons 11 through what is now the current 117. But I haven't been as invested in the show, so my ability to recall past episodes to reflect what's going on right now is going to be lacking. Yeah, but it's a different animal then with the Sister Wives, you've known Cody Jack Brown for <laughs> 10 plus years, and America has only known these new assholes for like, <laughs> like six weeks. Yeah. When you say it like that, that does sound like we're on the same boat. But I will say with the knowledge I do have, this is probably the worst season Married at First Sight US has ever had. I haven't watched the Australian or UK versions. With the exception of Nicole and Chris from last season, there have been no successful marriages since season 12 with Brianna and Vincent. What makes this season unique is that we are an episode or two away from decision day, and I don't think anyone has either slept together or made some indication that they're going to stay together on decision day. We'll get into it. Couples don't need to stay together to make the show entertaining. However, if there isn't going to be at least one person who is committed to marriage, aka the premise of the show, <laughs> then I do question the authenticity of these people, and that is what makes it unwatchable. It's kind of like when we discovered how not a family the Browns were, even before Sister Wives aired. You find out the men and women of the show just want to be on TV and not necessarily put in the work to be a supportive partner. Yeah, I'm of two minds about this. I can't tell whether or not they are just not interested in creating relationships or if they're just the worst. It's one or the other, right? Or both. <laughs> I mean, to be clear, I've always thought this show was terrible. And I've always thought the premise of the show is nonsense. And uh, Yeah, how come? I think that relationships are not based on institutions. They're not based on institutions. They're based on relationships. People stay together because of the relationship they have with the investment that they've put into that relationship. They don't stay together because a man in a funny hat said, you married. <laughs> 
I think the premise of the show is what happens when we give you what you say you wanted or what you say you need, and the answer is you're still unhappy. An alternate title for this show could be "All the Red Flags," or "You're Statistically Unlovable." Yeah, <laughs> we'll get to Orion later. <laughs> With that being said, let's get into the episode, shall we? Married at First Sight, Season Seventeen, Episode Seventeen: Crash and Bond. If you have to. Tim doesn't watch this show with me, but I'm intimately aware of all the things going on. Not the names, though. I have to ask every single time: Is this the guy with the dumb hat? <laughs> yeah, he hears me complain about these people often. So, just to catch him up, I'm going to give a quick rundown of who the cast is. First, you have Michael and Chloe. They were just married three episodes ago. The reason they were married at the tail end of the season is because Michael's first bride left him at the altar in episode one. I would say, out of all the men, he is the sweetest and probably most genuine. Yeah, most authentic. Some people might not like that authenticity, but I feel like he's trying. Yes, unlike the other men, he is trying to make a real connection. We then have Brennan and Emily. Some people on Reddit are saying they're the Eric and Virginia of this season, aka a party girl paired with a conservative man. I don't have evidence where Brennan falls on the political spectrum, so I'm not going to speculate. What I do know is that Brennan is not attracted to Emily. He's extremely stoic, not affectionate, and not a good communicator. So the complete opposite of what he purported to be in his application interviews. He's taciturn. Yes. Reticent. Yeah, he reminds me of Ryan from season thirteen, who is matched with Brett, who was very vivacious, and both of them, Brennan and Ryan, have the personality of drywall. I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> you keep mentioning. The third pairing is Orion and Lauren. Orion divorced Lauren over a perceived racist comment over the honeymoon. She apologized profusely, but Orion is just so unforgiving. He was definitely not ready for marriage、mm. or a relationship. Period. I mean, ignorance isn't always a justification, but in this case. It really did feel like that. Yeah, she was even saying, "I can make a whole presentation on the vernacular of what not to say in Native American culture," and he would not accept that. Yeah,、um, I could go into how I feel about him in that particular conversation, but I don't know if you want to go into that right now. <laughs> yeah, it might turn up. Then we have Claire and Cameron. This is the therapist woman and New Zealand man. I just don't think they're each other's persons. They. Just don't get along that great. Cameron tends to hide a lot of things about himself, and in turn, she isn't affectionate with him. I don't know if he's just not a people person, since he does unusual things that would put someone off. There was this one time he was meeting Claire's friends, and he thought that would be the best moment to tell Claire that his father is on his deathbed. And understandably, it made her confused, since this was her first time knowing about his dying parent. And when she questioned him about this disparity in information, Cameron was just, "Oh, you didn't ask." Like he's trying to pin all the lack of communication on her. He doesn't put effort into being open himself, which is. A very self-centered way to behave. I mean, isn't that kind of an unknown unknown? You don't know that you don't know that. Yeah. How are people supposed to know that they should ask certain things about you when you're a stranger to them? Is there a list of questions you're supposed to ask? First of all, is your father dying? <laughs> is your mother an astronaut? <laughs> is your sister a rodeo clown? Yeah, like a checklist of some sort. I don't know. There's one glaring flaw with 99% of the people who go on this show. It is they are all disingenuous. They're all dishonest. Half of the people just don't like the other person, but they're just faking it. They don't want to say it. 
I don't know what's up with Chloe and Michael yet. I'm gonna hold off my opinion until we learn more about them. Oh, I thought you were gonna say you're gonna hold off on that until that train wreck has come to a... Yeah, start. spoilers on Reddit, which I won't reveal here, but... I still have hope. <laughs> Anyways, um... God knows why. Back to Claire and Cameron. Claire also does have her own issues. She tends to have her therapist persona all the time whenever she talks with Cameron, which does make her come off as inauthentic because you can't build a connection when you have this mask on. But to keep you up to date, Cameron hasn't been on any recent episodes since he's recovering from heart surgery. And they're also separated even before his operation took place. So why is he still on the show? There's not much point to having either of them be on camera, but this season is a pariah <laughs> because obviously every couple here is not really viable. I mean, you know who's probably the most pissed of all people watching this season? Who? That one lady who was just terrible on the show a couple seasons back. Oh, Alyssa? Yeah, where <laughs> she was like, I want to be on the show! Well, that's kind of what Orion was trying to do. Orion and Alyssa were pretty much saying, I don't want to continue the marriage, but I do want to continue the process. <laughs> and all of us are thinking, yeah, but the process is the marriage. You just want to keep getting paid to be here. So I don't even know why Orion's here. Oh no, you just answered the question. The question is, why did the producers let him stay? Yes. Why was he more convincing than Alyssa? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Finally, the last couple we have is Austin and Becca. This is the couple that was paired together because they both play Mario Kart. I'm joking. <laughs> There's obviously more criteria to it than that. To put it simply, Becca has been very vocal to Austin that she wants to be more physically intimate with him, but he's just not being honest if he really wants to be with her. And that's where we are with these couples. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't like to play Mario Kart? <laughs> that's like putting two people together who both like Coke. I guess they also own their own Nintendo 64 still. <laughs> okay, that's impressive. The bar is low. Because I don't know if this was a rumor or if it was said on After Party. Because I admit I don't watch every single After Party episode. But I think it was mentioned that Becca said her deal breaker was that she didn't want to marry a Christian man. And then I think Austin's deal breaker was the same. He didn't want to marry a non-Christian woman. And oh, lo and behold, they were matched for whatever reason. But they like Mario Kart. <laughs> uh, don't you know? Wars have been started over Mario Kart. I don't remember the last time somebody started a war about Christianity. <laughs> yeah, everyone remembers what happened in the Great Blue Shell Revolution. <laughs> Before we proceed into the recap, I will mention that I'm going to put pictures of which couples I'm talking about post-production, just so you know what they look like if you've never watched this show. I still don't know what uh, Austin? No. Wait, who's the New Zealand guy? Um, Cameron. I, I just still don't know what he looks like. Eh, he's Caucasian. He's tall. He's, I think, a brunette. Eh, not much to say. Um... <sighs> He's a kiwi. <laughs> oh, that's what he gave Claire on their, well, not a real kiwi, but a plushie in their wedding. All right, so to start off, we are in the hospital after Emily's devastating ATV accident. This was really scary. She's so lucky she didn't sustain some kind of head injury that resulted in a coma. Or eye injury or neck injury yes. or just more injury. Yeah, because that's what happened to one of my relatives. Hmm the past year unfortunately they didn't make it so some people underestimate how dangerous tripping can be and she as we'll find out later moving vehicle yes um into a tree brennan lays it out for us the doctor diagnosed emily with a severe cut on her scalp it seems that she crashed into a tree and the branch went under her helmet which is why that part of her body sustained damage but luckily, the branch missed all vital parts of her head. I still don't understand how that could have happened. I guess the helmet's here and then the branch went like... It's, it's really good that she had the helmet on so that it could at least direct where the branch was going. What kind of helmet was she wearing? I don't know. When I think of an ATV helmet, I'm thinking the full helmet. 
、oh. the visor that goes up and down. I don't think she was wearing that. I think it was just like it looked like one of those flak helmets in RimWorld, just a standard one with a strap underneath her chin. Hmm. I knew some people that had ATVs, and they wouldn't have gone without a full helmet. Yeah. Maybe it was a TV、yeah. thing. I don't That's think. That's not the kind of helmet I was thinking.、Though. Yeah, there's no covering on the face. Do you think that was a TV thing? She does have ear coverings. Yeah, I know, but. Okay. Yeah, maybe they're like. We can't see your face. Oh boy. <sighs> which which we? Oh, I'm just looking at what I think of when I think of ATV helmet. Yeah, I know the one that Aurora was wearing when we saw her take those corners. It was completely. Yeah, that's a standard ATV、yeah. helmet. I guess they didn't want us to think that there was a body double <laughs> on the vehicle. It was probably the show just wanted to have her face on camera.、Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's entirely on the show.、Mm -hmm. If she was wearing a proper helmet, that shouldn't have happened.、Mm -hmm. Maybe there is some lawsuit Emily can embark on. I don't know. Whatever. But don't they have to like sign waivers or something? Just because you signed a piece of paper doesn't mean that the contract is actually valid.、Mm. As Emily is in recovery, Brennan makes sure to keep everyone back at the retreat posted on her condition. The phone is then handed to his wife. The rest of the cast give their support and gratitude that nothing more serious happened. Just to give a picture of what's going on, Emily's entire left side of her hair is covered in dried blood. Brennan is doing a decent job of being by her side. That's the least you can expect of someone who, at the beginning of last episode, said that he wanted separate rooms when they just arrived to the retreat mansion. My fear for Emily is that she's going to take his basic caring as a sign that he wants to be with her, which is not the case. No, not the case at all. A couple whose loyalty is still up in the air is the most newly wed of them all. Michael and Chloe are busy packing to join up with the rest of the crew. The fashion-forward man has decided to don a skirt on the first day of meeting up as an official husband. Some people have voiced they don't like his skirts. He's wearing leggings slash pants under it. If I didn't know any better, it just looks like he wrapped a jacket around his waist. If a guy wore that in front of me, I just think he was a fashionista. And Michael pulls it off, so that's my controversial opinion. I do think he has the personality to wear this kind of attire. When I see people who are overtly distinct in how they choose to present themselves, whether that be their clothes, their hair color, or tattoos, it actually makes me happy. Since to me, that means I'm in the presence of someone who is just being comfortable and confident of who they are. Yeah, I mean, most people they would prefer. A person that's unremarkable because they would rather have somebody who nobody really notices or pays attention to, and be secure in the sense that I am generally seen positively than to have somebody who's actually unique that might have a stronger effect on people, but that some people might be you know uncomfortable with. Because Michael was always like that. He wore, I think, rose-colored boots to his application interview, and a lot of the fandom are saying he's just trying too hard to stand out already. Because he already is that person with his side-shaved head, his jewelry, and now he wants to wear a skirt. I'm like, we don't know enough about him to say he's being inauthentic. From what we've seen of him, I don't pick up any vibe that he's malicious or he's trying to be someone he's not.、Uh, Why would he even need to stand out? He's already supposed to have been paired with somebody. Why would he want to stand out? Yeah, it's up to Chloe to reject this guy based on his aesthetic. But to give her credit, she is trying.、Mm -hmm. She is trying. Oh, speaking of, she seems a little distracted at the amount of kilts he's decided to take with him. She makes a joke that she'll be the one wearing the jeans, and he can be chic with his surfeit of skirts. He laughs at her light-hearted jab. How dare you!、Mm -hmm. In her talking head, the self-proclaimed minimalist hopes that these quirks of his will be more normal to her as time goes on. Chloe is also looking forward to getting to know the rest of her season seventeen cohorts. I don't know why. <laughs> 
Michael is optimistic and hopes that meeting with the other couples teaches him something he can apply to his own marriage. You can see examples of how not to act. Yes, it's like what Emily said during his wedding. She said to Brennan, her husband, "What advice could you possibly give them?" Because Brennan said to Emily, "Oh, I'm just going there in support of my friend and to give advice." And she got really upset when he said that. It's like you don't have any advice. Not good advice, anyway. <laughs> We are back in Foxfield, Colorado, where the Miller Mansion is. Apparently, Becca is holed up in her room since she is ill with gastroenteritis. Austin has made her some buttered toast and proceeds to kiss her. For some reason, he pretends that her stomach bug is preventing him from going deeper into the relationship. Literally. <laughs> What? <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying pretending. Because I don't think he had any plans to be sexually intimate with her, whether she was sick or not. Luckily, due to her illness, he can delay that task even further. Dude, you're just not into her. He says, "I hope we can grow our intimacy when she feels better." <sighs> I have a feeling he wouldn't be able to grow his intimacy. <laughs> Who is definitely on the road to feeling better is Emily. She is awake in her hospital bed, staring at Brennan, who is right next to her. She gives him her gratitude for sitting with her all day. He tries to cheer her up, saying she is a warrior. Unfortunately, Emily is feeling warriored out. She tries to turn this instant into one that'll magically transform Brennan into an affectionate husband. So, to give you a picture of what's going on, Emily is. Obviously, on the hospital bed, Brennan is maybe a couple feet away from her, and she's the one that has to kind of reach over to like hold his hand, and he's not even gripping onto her fingers. And I know you shouldn't really look too closely into body language, but to me, that screamed he's just not emotionally invested into her. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> he's sitting here like this. I'll do the head. You be her. <laughs> you're like leaning out of the bed. It's like all of your、uh, IVs are popping out, and he's just like,、oh, yes, yes. You know, I'm very good at communication. <laughs> the stoic man explains the treatment Emily will be receiving. Her head was split open four and a half inches from her forehead to her scalp, which, of course, will be needing stitches. He reckons that if Emily wanted to conceal the sutures in the future, she would need plastic surgery. By and large, her scar is the extent of the damage and is going to be a-okay. Good. Brennan then says something strange. He asserts that this instant made it so that people were able to see how supportive he is as a spouse. I'm sure he's <laughs> very interested in the next woman seeing how supportive he is. <laughs> This is what Brennan is going to point to to show how supportive he is of his partner. He goes, "The fact that we were able to overcome it together shows the type of bond that we do have, who we are as people, and why we were meant to be in each other's lives." This reminded me of application process Brennan, where he kind of just goes on autopilot and he just says what he thinks will earn him the most points, or what will get him the job or that spot on TV. Because he doesn't mean what he says. You guys don't have a bond. In fact, I guarantee that after this getaway, he's going to reset his marriage again. Because he asked for that during the expert visits. He's like, "We just need a reset." AKA, I don't know you. <laughs> You're a stranger again. <laughs> he treats their marriage like a Wi-Fi router. <laughs> oh no, it's not working. Better reset the marriage. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not the router's fault that you have 0.2 megabits per second. <laughs> Michael and Chloe arrive to the gigantic house to meet up with everyone. They are greeted with a ton of hugs. The both of them are questioned on how their honeymoon went down. Chloe is confident in their initial interactions, saying that Michael touched her soul. She can't imagine them being more vulnerable than how they were during those first few days. Lauren, who might have been feeling a bit envious of their chemistry, says that she loves cute like that. 
The conversation is interrupted by Austin notifying the newlyweds of where his wife is. Becca is unable to make her introductions due to her stomach bug. Lauren adds to the explanation of where the other unavailable people are. She relays what happened to Emily and makes sure to note that she suffered no concussions in her ATV crash and is bound to join them soon. Michael and Chloe are put at ease at this wave of new information. We then learn that production was able to hire a personal chef which will be ready with their dinner. We immediately cut to that chef. Spencer is busy making the house guest some steak, which I think Austin said in the after party he knew the chef that was brought in. I think he, oh wait, no, no, that was the chef of the NFL star, which was why he was excited to be in the mansion. Okay, never mind. Different cook. Sorry. Austin was very excited to be in that bed. <laughs> that interaction where he didn't want to be with Becca kind of reminded me of those interactions in the movie Big with Tom Hanks, where a woman's kind of coming on to him. He obviously is still a child and he gets scared or he doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so he grabs his blankie and runs away to his race car. <laughs> Anyways. Where's his baseball cap? Yes. Back to the dinner. The table is beautifully set for the remaining two couples and Claire, Lauren, and Orion. <laughs> Seriously, those last three did not need to be here. Claire gives some tidbits to Chloe, saying that they were going to throw a final party during their stay here, and the theme would have been dress as your partner. Chloe smiles, saying she already sort of experienced that when Michael and her were checking out each other's apartments. The minimalist woman expounds on that, saying Michael has taken a fancy to her earrings and pearl necklaces. I was going to say, she keeps using that word, minimalist. She's not a minimalist. If people identify as a minimalist, then maybe we should give that to them. We'll know more about Chloe's past later. Sometimes people will now say they're a minimalist because in the past they Before had so her. much stuff and now... Maybe they shed 98% of it, and what they have now is what they okay. would consider minimalist. They're a relative minimalist. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Austin teases him, saying he thought Michael's kilt belonged to Chloe. The stylish man acquiesces to his observation, exclaiming that that was reasonable to assume. They divert to a topic where they discuss Austin's playful side. Last episode, he was pretty tipsy. He was singing all night to the point that it woke up the entire house. This fun banter is interrupted by Spencer, who is bringing out their dinner, steak with chimichurri, which is Argentine barbecue sauce. Okay. The meal is put on pause long enough for Chloe to declare that she's glad to have finally met the rest of her castmates, considering everyone else has gotten a six-week head start. Both Michael and her give a rundown of how their first week of getting to know one another went. Both are pretty much on the same page in terms of values. Michael admits that if there were dissimilarities in their morals, this process would be much more difficult to maneuver, and it's already proven to be very fatiguing. To address these challenges, Chloe is trying to be more intentional in how she conveys anything to Michael. I think she's trying to say that she's being a better communicator than how she usually is, just to give this arranged marriage a fighting chance, which, good on you, Chloe. That is the correct mindset when you sign up for this show. Seriously, with a lot of these people, it's signing up for an eating contest and then being, you know what? I don't really like hot dogs. And <laughs> it's a hot dog eating contest. So you better get used to it for eight weeks. I mean, you signed up for this thing. This is on you. <laughs> uh-huh. Lauren agrees. From her own divorce, she advises Chloe to be willing to give grace. She says that forgiveness is an important element of this journey since both of you know nothing of the other. She's obviously referring to Orion, who pretty much held a grudge against Lauren, even when she tried to rectify her offense. I don't think that he was even mad about that. I think he just didn't like her. and Yeah, he used this as an out to put a close on their marriage. I think what happened was he was talking to her, and she said something that could be considered insensitive and then he got excited because he's like oh my gosh i'm going to be able to call this woman out on national television so that everyone's going to know just how great i am and how sensitive mm -hmm. i am and 
Especially when he's, this is the second time I've had to deal with racism in my life. And it's, dude, people have to deal with racism all day, every day. <laughs> and he can now point to the two times he has suffered from it once in high school and now with his wife, who wasn't even intent on hurting him. Seriously, it's... I could talk about Orion and his bull for quite a while. By the way, Orion is side-eyeing her as she's saying this. <laughs> this segues into a discussion of how everyone else is doing. Of course, in order to portray himself in a positive light, Orion speaks up. He explains that Lauren and he were only married for ten days until a lot of intense things came up after the honeymoon. He tries to pin the uncomfortable atmosphere at dinner on Lauren, saying, There's a lot of tension, and I just wanted to come to this retreat so I can have some peace of mind. Hopefully, she and I can find some common ground. No, just go home. <laughs> We don't need common ground. Unsurprisingly, he doesn't mention to Chloe and Michael that the divorce was 100% his fault, nor the fact that the reason Lauren is feeling tense is because of how he exited the marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lauren sits in silence for a few seconds before taking a sip of her drink. She did not know Orion wanted to have a talk with her about finding common ground. In her side interview, she divulges that her ex-husband is a disingenuous person. He acts one way in front of their castmates and another way when it's just the both of them. Mm -hmm. In fact, up until this getaway, there has been no communication from him until a filming opportunity presented itself. I'm surprised he hasn't asked for separation counseling. <laughs> Or no, divorce counseling. Oh, like what Cody wanted from Christine. <laughs> divorce counseling. He's trying to initiate that right now. Exactly. Lauren refuses to respond to his inauthentic proposal and continues to drink her wine. Mm. As she should. He needs to sit in his awkwardness. She is well within her right to be pissed off. He's just scared people on the internet are going to perceive him as a dumbass. Which they have. So, mm -hmm. no going back. Anyways, commercial break and we are back at the hospital. Brennan opens the scene by asking Emily if she'd be more comfortable going back to meet up with everyone or to just go straight home. She opts for the first choice because she can really use the hugs right now. Brennan acknowledges her decision. He conveys that even before the accident, their marriage was already in a bad place. He does, quote, care about her. And that is enough for him to pray that her surgery will go well. As she rolls away to the operation room, he lackadaisically comments that he will be there for her, quote, in sickness and in health. Again, this event isn't going... To change anything, it's obvious he's not going to stick around after decision day, so it would be great if he'd stop sprinkling in this marriage vernacular of in sickness and in health. I feel those kinds of vows should be reserved for people who are at least thinking of some level of commitment. I'm still trying to picture what any of these people expected mm -hmm. to be on this show. I think everyone on the show expects to be paired with someone who is very sexy, agrees with them on everything, and is generally way out of their league. That's probably why they needed to go on the show to get married. <laughs> Back at the frat house, er, NFL mansion, production has devised a game for the remaining cast to occupy their time with. Everyone's forced to play a version of Who Done It, which is an icebreaker game where Participants write a fact about themselves and everyone tries to guess who did which thing. To sum up what happened, Michael had an afro, Claire had a bowl cut back in the day, and Austin French kissed a donkey. He didn't say that exactly. He wrote, he open mouth kissed a donkey, so we don't know if the donkey's mouth was open too. Goodness, this guy will do anything with <laughs> anything. <laughs> But not with Becca, apparently. <laughs> Chloe remarks. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah? <laughs> What? <laughs> What? Austin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many directions to take this. Um, <laughs> Austin. Man, dude, dude, I don't want to say that you're weird, 
and that maybe you've got some sexual predilections. But the thing is, is I'm not just pulling that out of nowhere. <laughs> That's coming from you, Austin. <laughs> You're putting that idea in our heads. I'm thinking scenarios. I'm always going to be alone because of my secret desires. Unless I could trick a woman into marrying me. Oh, boy. <laughs> anyway. Chloe remarks that she, too, loves donkeys, but not that much. <laughs> the last whodunit trivia belongs to Chloe herself. Back in the mid-2000s, she went to a party that NSYNC just happened to throw and accidentally spilled a Jaeger bomb onto one of the band members of Good Charlotte. And that's... The band. Yes. Well, I was trying to explain what a Jaeger bomb is. I think it's Jaeger put into a cup of Red Bull. Most it's like people, a drink within a drink. Most people who go to parties would know what a Jaeger bomb is. <laughs> I didn't. I had to look up what it was. I know. I know you. <laughs> oh, by the way, that band member was... Benji Madden, who is married to Cameron Diaz. So that's a fun fact. Fun fact. Fun fact. I like Chloe. She's more daring than what her self-label of recovering perfectionist would lead you to believe. Hmm. This excites Michael, who is eager to know more about this woman's past. Someone who is definitely not curious what their partner or ex-partner is up to is Orion. The cameras are rolling. He takes this as his cue to pull Lauren aside and talk about their relationship. He alludes back to the tension from dinner, a.k.a. he perceives that Lauren is being standoffish for no reason. <laughs> He's half right. <laughs> he starts off the conversation with lies. He announces his desire to build some sort of bridge between them. To put it simply, he just wants she and him to get their story straight of how their divorce went down so he can stop being portrayed as a villain. He goes, let's team up together so that in the future we can have the same narrative. Lauren is calm, but irritated. She finds it ironic how much he yearns to have some type of partnership with her, as a divorcee, than he ever wanted to as a married man. She brings up the fact that he was the one who was so obstinate to end their marriage. She doesn't think he's being sincere because if that really were his goal, he could have at any time during this retreat have had private talks about this bridge building or at least texted her. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he waits for her to be put on the spot in front of other people and the cameras in an effort for him to be seen as magnanimous. Her eyes start to get red from holding back tears. Orion's excuse is just as pathetic as he is. He didn't think of communicating with her because, quote, I might say something wrong and then things will go south. I don't know. She seems pretty level-headed to me. Yeah. I feel Lauren is very articulate when she speaks. From all the episodes we've seen, she's very reasonable when she's put under pressure and she's still well-spoken. I don't know why Orion keeps wanting to portray her as, like, angry or the one who is aloof without explanation. Well, because if he doesn't make her out to be the one being like that, then people are going to see that he's, in fact, the one like that. Mm-hmm. Lauren responds that whenever Orion brings up these sorts of hopeful topics, she engages in her own struggle between her heart and head. There's a part of her that wants to believe her ex really does care and is only striving for clarity. Luckily for Lauren, her head seems to be the stronger of the two and warns her that, quote, this is some bull****. <laughs> Orion maintains that his intentions are true. The cautious woman isn't so keen on that. She wants a few days to sit on his words, since ever since the honeymoon, she felt like she was on an island by herself. She empathizes with Orion, saying that he was emotionally charged and just couldn't handle things any better when he called for a divorce. However, it's aftermath has left her mentally fatigued, and she doesn't think a bridge is possible. Yeah, it's difficult to make a bridge with someone who's been acting so mm -hmm. irrationally. Mm -hmm. Just at that point, you don't share any sort of common ground with them. They are entirely just wild card random. They could do anything. They're totally unpredictable. And that's just exhausting. Speaking of someone who is exhausted, Emily is back at the retreat. She looks very weathered out. Aside from a black eye, her hair is also pulled back to reveal the stitches running from her temple to the top of her frontal lobe. 
In the midst of her many hugs, she refers to herself as Frankenstein. Everyone settles in to hear the story of her accident. She ran into a tree. Its branch went under her helmet. Once she collided with it, blood started to gush from what she thought was her nose. She lifted a hand to check and realized that wasn't the source of the bleeding. At that point, she started to panic that things were more serious than she thought. Thankfully, Brennan darted right up to her and immediately called the ambulance. She ends her harrowing tale with a safety lesson. Always wear your helmet. The emergency responders reckon that she would have died without it. So there was a point, I don't know if it was last summer or not, where Tim and I are, I said this before, we're homebodies and I wanted to either do something exciting. There was a point I wanted to go on ATVs or go to a nearby amusement park or something. Mm -hmm. But after watching these last two episodes, and of course watching Sister Wise with Dayton's ATV accident, I think I'm going to cross that off my bucket list because it just seems that they're very dangerous. I'm not that much of a thrill seeker to go on these four wheelers anytime soon. I mean, yeah. You've been on an yeah. ATV before. They're okay, I guess. Yeah. I know comments will tell me, oh, they're perfectly safe as long as you're on the right terrain and you're wearing the appropriate attire. But she wasn't. That was not an appropriate ATV helmet. I think that was the TV crew had her wear that helmet because they wanted a better look at her face. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who gets to suffer because of it. Mm -hmm. So I would very much like my head intact. So Brennan gives his wife a lot of kudos, saying she is such a trooper to come back and be chipper than ever. Because of her injury, he is motivated to step up and help her heal faster. He leaves it at that and takes Emily by the arm to escort her back to their bed. Or back to her bed. They're staying in separate rooms. Do you think that he is more attracted to her when she is needing his masculine oh, assistance? Maybe. Yeah. Because she's less willful because she's on so much pain medication and so much more controllable. I mean, I don't know what Brennan asked for when he signed up for this show because Emily, I forgot what role she was in her job. She seems to be a higher up in whatever company she works at. And I thought that was something he might have specifically asked for somewhere along the lines of like a power couple. I hate um, the power couples on this show. <laughs> They're the worst. They are always just the most toxic pair of jack yeah because once you reach a point in your life where you can say that you are super successful you're less apt to be emotionally dependent yeah to be as interdependent on someone else i don't know why they don't work someone who is also on their own journey to self-recovery is becca she is self-filming and updates the audience on her stomach bug she comments that she isn't looking too good as she records from her phone Referring to herself as one of the walking dead, she pauses for a sec and makes a joke that that is probably more accurate of Emily, who is looking like Frankenstein's monster. Emily's words, not mine. <laughs> it is the next morning. Chloe has a stash of face and foot masks she wants the ladies to apply for some gal pal bonding time. Okay, it's disturbing how many of the applicants to the show really just want to hang out with all the other girls. Why, you think they signed up for the show just to have friends? Yeah, it's like the women who become polygamists because they want friends. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of in a alienation epidemic. This is juxtaposed against what the men are up to. Of course, they are not partaking in these frivolous self-care activities. They are doing the most manly recreation for testosterone time. Gambling, specifically Texas Hold'em. Side note, testosterone time is what Janelle from Sister Wives calls Cody's man trips. Back to the ladies. Emily has arrived with her tumbler. Lauren comments that the washed up blood on Emily's blonde hair gives the appearance that she has pink highlights now. Chloe is asked to repeat how she and Michael are doing since Emily missed that exchange. The brunette says that this process is a whirlwind, but Michael has made it so she is, for the most part, at ease. She continues to applaud his character and is just glad that he is her match. I really hope these two work out. If it doesn't, it's probably because Chloe just isn't used to Michael's flamboyance. She just doesn't like Michael. That's how Michael is. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, speaking of, back at the poker table, Michael divulges that he does try and show his more humorous side when he is with Chloe. An example of that was when he asked if he could borrow a pair of her earrings. Brennan is a little confused and questions him if he was being serious. The fashionista responds that it was just a joke, but at the same time he was testing the waters. If she said yes, he would just make a note that he could wear her earrings in the future. He wasn't planning on stealing her jewelry or anything. The women's conversation continues. Lauren recommends that Chloe listen to her triggers instead of bottling up her anxieties. I think Lauren is recommending to Chloe to just tell Michael that he isn't her type. Because a lot of people on Reddit are saying Michael just needs to tone it down and then he'd be a better match for the ladies. I understand that in marriage you do have to compromise some aspects of your life in order to function with another person. But this is an arranged TV marriage. It's not Michael's job to try and fit the mold that Chloe wants him to be, especially if he has to change something as innate to him as how he wants to present himself. That would be compromising a lot of his authentic self. If Chloe doesn't like that aspect of him, there is a woman out there who's going to appreciate his eccentricities. It's the expert's job to put two people together that like each other. It's not Michael's job to make Chloe like him. And if anything, it is Chloe's job to try to see what's likable in Michael. Mm -hmm. Michael already is pretty clear that he likes Chloe, so I don't think he needs to do sh Yeah, and we will get into it. I think Chloe is getting more attracted to Michael the more she knows about him. So, I don't know. Hopefully this can work out. If not, people just need to say, we don't want to stay together. We can just wrap up this season and move on to season 18 instead of being forced to watch these people torture themselves. You know, it's like when the manager sends everybody home early. It's a half day. Yeah. It's a half season. See you tomorrow. <laughs> like, yeah, come and see on Monday. You know, there's no work is happening here today, so I'm not paying you. Because in season one, I think it was maybe 11 episodes. I can't remember. And they've just been making each one longer than the other. I don't know why <laughs> they can't just... Well, it makes them more money. Uh, you know, if they can stretch out a season to twice the length, they make twice the amount of money. That's true. And the issue is, are people going to still watch it? And the answer is yes. <laughs> People have uh, low standards. Uh, I feel like we're talking about Sister Wives again. <laughs> that shows such torture. <laughs> Speaking of torture, Brennan is asked by Orion if this most recent traumatic experience has given him pause about his marriage to Emily. Brennan gives a roundabout no. He doesn't actually answer no. He just says that he's doing the best he can. And I'm saying it's torture because obviously it's annoying when people are just not being honest or upfront about what is actually happening. Meanwhile, Emily is tearing up, asserting that Brennan was the best partner she could have had during this situation. I worry about her because you said she hasn't been in a relationship before. Yeah, so she doesn't know what it looks like when your husband is... Actually supportive? Yes. From this whole incident... Brennan basically behaved like the guy in all of the CPR training manuals that says, go call an ambulance and then come right back. It's the stranger level of commitment. Yeah, it's like a coworker Level of commitment. And the issue that I'm having with Emily here, it's fraught on three levels. One, she's never been in a relationship before, so she should not be measuring relationships based on this. Two, she's got a lot of emotions going through her, that's not a great time to make a decision. And three, pain medication. Yes. Lots of pain, lots of drugs inside of her system. Pain medication will make it so that your physical hurts don't hurt, but they also make it so that your emotional hurts don't hurt. And that means you might overlook some kind of that you're married to. <laughs> yeah, like you said, I think she's trying to make this a pivotal moment that will make Brennan see her as more than a friend. <laughs> this is when the relationship really turned around. Again, that's kind of akin to she and Brennan forming some sort of survivor bond due to this incident, and she's totally 
misconstruing it to be potential romance. Oh my gosh. She's like in high school. Like total teenager love. We then cut to footage of Becca in her bedroom trying to keep some food down. She's going to be fine, but not fine enough to participate in the next group activity. Lauren has suggested to production to have some sort of yoga exercise. They agreed and have hired two instructors for the day. As expected, Becca and Emily will be sitting out the session. There is a small interaction where Brennan is looking out for his wife's well-being, and that's when he tells her to stop dangling her head due to her injury. He chuckles to her. That's like the one thing they told you not to do. Emily is just appreciative for this modicum of concern. Dangling head? Yeah, because they do different poses. Oh, yeah. You don't want the, to build up the mm -hmm. blood in mm -hmm. her head, yeah. We then get to the second half of the activity, and this is where the yogini slash spiritual instructor slash yoga master wants to transition from physical exercises to a discussion. She opens the discourse with a question. How can you best show compassion within your marriage? The person who excels the most at giving the most perfect but fake answers is the first to speak up. Brennan states that he shows compassion in his marriage by being the most empathetic and understanding man that he can be. Well, I agree. He is being the most understanding and empathetic <laughs> man that he can be. Which is like a robot level. He's chat GPT. <laughs> Lauren is the second to reply. Despite not being in a marriage herself, she actually gives a poignant answer. She shows compassion in her relationships by first practicing it on herself. This is because you can't rely on the compassion from your partner all the time. If you foster that love within, it'll naturally flow towards other people. This is clearly a dig towards Orion, who was nothing but apathetic to Lauren during their 10-day marriage. Yes, she couldn't rely on her husband all the time or at all. <laughs> this rouses the very self-absorbed man. He tries to counter Lauren's implication that he wasn't compassionate. He makes an announcement to the entire group that he will make efforts to reach out to his ex via FaceTime, text, and phone calls. Like, come on, Orion. Lauren just told you last night she hates being put on the spot, especially when you only make these promises in front of other people. Also, she kind of hates you. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the exact thing she took issue with. After the discussion winds down, the couples meet with each other again. Austin expresses relief that Becca is feeling well enough to sit through what looked like a 30-minute workout. She laughs a little, saying, if Emily is feeling well enough after getting surgery, Becca herself could at least endure being out and about with everyone else. It doesn't take long for the topic to be steered to what it always boils down to. Intimacy. Or the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Once again, Austin apologizes that he's not having sex with her. Becca says that her ongoing nausea and the fact that Austin was wasted two nights ago prevented opportunities for that. Austin says he wants to see how things pan out. His wife reminds him that she still wants him to make efforts to flirt with her. The problem that I have with Austin is not that he just doesn't want to have sex with her. It's just that he keeps telling her that he will try to do better. I think it was with Dr. Pia where she gave them several exercises to increase their intimacy and he just uses those opportunities to use their tools in a goofy way. When you usually apologize for something, it usually comes with some sort of changed behavior and I don't think he has intention to change his behavior. I don't know. I don't want to speak too much because at least for him, he thinks the intimacy is getting better or is progressing. That might just be him trying to... I don't want to say gaslit, but just trying to be, oh, but it is getting better. It is getting better. But it's like, no, it isn't. So in this instant, we know that Orion is an asshole where he ended his marriage after 10 days. But Austin is just doing a Cody. He's kind of stringing her along. Yeah. I mean, Orion wasn't being honest about it. He did it in the form of a lie because he wanted to look like he was a victim but with Austin, there's something wrong. There's something <laughs> wrong. Like, it could be so many things. And by being quiet about it, he's 
just giving everybody the opportunity to think of the worst possible thing it could be. Because I know people that will be like, it's none of your business if he doesn't want to slip it in someone. I'm like, yeah, but when you sign up for a reality TV show, you kind of put your personal life to be everyone's business. That's so, what you're getting paid for. Yeah, if you just don't like Becca or you just are not ready for that, then you need to tell her, this is why I'm having issues of trying to be more sexy with you or something. Yes, there's a double standard between men and women. Yes, if a man wants sex and a woman doesn't want to have sex, then it's entirely acceptable for the woman to say no without any sort of explanation. And men are in this position where they are expected to say yes in every situation. And so, yeah, that sucks. It really does. But that's not the thing that we're taking issue to with Austin. Austin's being dishonest. It's clear that he does not want to have physical relationship with this woman. Just say you don't want a physical relationship with this woman. Don't just keep saying that, oh, the mood wasn't right. Oh, I wasn't feeling it. Or I just really wanted to be in the big football bed. <laughs> say that you don't want it. And you don't have to say why. Just say that you don't want it. And we'll be like, oh, he must be going through some and that would be perfectly acceptable. The issue is not that he doesn't want to have sex. It's just that he's just not being honest about the situation. Back with Orion and Lauren. Orion takes another opportunity to give Lauren some false hope, at least in terms of being friends. They are sitting outside on a picnic blanket. He kicks off his talking points by commending Lauren's idea to have the yoga instructors over. It seems that he has learned a lot from what they had to say. <laughs> Lauren acknowledges his appreciation, saying that was the point of the lessons, to put everyone in a different head-slash-heart space. She does somewhat prevent Orion from carrying out his objective, which was to reopen lines of communication to her. She confesses that she doesn't know how much she can receive of Orion whilst navigating their divorce. Moreover, she doesn't see them having genuine friendship after their season ends. I don't want to see her face. <laughs> She emphasizes that all her current friendships are very intentional slash genuine, implying that Orion is neither of those things. She scrunches her face, saying that she didn't think she would feel the emotions of a breakup because their marriage barely lasted a week. But it ended up feeling that way. If Orion had reached out within those first few weeks following the divorce instead of ghosting her, she might have been more cooperative to his need to building bridges. But she doesn't get that vibe from him. Orion nods, saying maybe she just needs a couple days to a week to sit on this offer. Lauren agrees with that timeline. They leave it at that. Because that's the end of the show. <laughs> it ends at that point, no matter what. Mm. He's just doing damage control at this point. It is now time for the second group activity. Everyone heads on down to Ninja Nation, where the gang will test their athletic prowess on a series of obstacle courses. Unfortunately, the most athletic of the group is sitting this out again. Emily is holding a pair of pom-poms to cheer on the rest of the participants. And she's the most athletic because she and Brennan were playing indoor soccer, and that's when she revealed she's, I think, high school captain, and her father pretty much forced her to participate in state and national tournaments. Which she believed was quite traumatic, and <laughs> Brennan's, man, that trauma was super hot. Don't you think that trauma made you a better, stronger person? And she's like, no. In fact, I didn't like that trauma at all, one bit. Brennan just doesn't get it, people, or Emily. The first challenge is using what looks like a trapeze to swing onto some metal bars called the squirrel handles. Claire is shown looking very ripped. She almost makes it through this section, but is unable to dismount onto the platform. Yeah, she had delts. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well-developed triceps. Yeah. Michael is able to complete the challenge. By the way, in After Party, it was mentioned that Austin also completed this part of the obstacle course. But for whatever reason, they didn't air his segment. <laughs> I don't know if production just hates him, but that was regrettable. I would have loved to have seen Becca's reaction of him. I mean, it's not like they even have enough stuff to cut things. So, yeah. this seems bizarre. It must have been really boring. <laughs> the second contest is your standard warped wall. Each person has to make a running start and jump to climb their way to the top. 
The only ones that made it were Claire and Michael. Claire had to use the second wall that was more proportional to her height, obviously. Mm. Michael completing all the tasks delights Chloe, who is very impressed by his strength and agility. It does appear that Chloe is seeming to be very attracted to Michael when he's showing more of his masculine side. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh my gosh, he's putting all those other men in their place. Oh, yes. Right now, if I think about that, I could ignore all the other things I don't like about him. Anyways, I just hope her other hang-ups about him don't get in the way. Mm. Anyways, Michael chalks up his expert ninja skills to growing up on kung fu movies and his own martial arts training. After the obstacle courses, everyone sits down to talk about the people who crush the challenges. Becca makes a joke that Michael goes to this place regularly. <laughs> I googled how much do these monthly memberships at these kinds of places cost. It's three times your average gym membership. On top of that, you only get to be there for a set amount of hours each day. Mm -hmm. I guess it's because they're afraid of wear and tear of the equipment. I think they just know that people are willing to pay that much. I mean, it is a gym, but it's also like an entertainment thing. Because if you really want to impress people on American Ninja Warrior, you'd have to go to these specific places. I mean, yeah. And the upkeep might be more... It might be insurance costs, too. Mm -hmm. The subject then takes a turn. Brennan points out that he and Emily are bonded through their traumatic experience and are closer than ever before. I get it. Whether or not he stays with her in the end, this will be a core memory for him, where he was essentially the first responder in this incident. This gives Emily some optimism that when they return to their shared apartment, maybe Brennan will start looking at her differently. We will see. <laughs> yeah. Someone who is definitely feeling at home already is Michael. He has taken the liberty to drop a candlelit bubble bath for himself. Chloe just so happens to walk in as Michael settles into the tub. She starts the banter by complimenting his ninja skills, joking that production planned an entire activity solely based on his talents. He tries to downplay his prowess, voicing that he was fully prepared to snap his hip during one of the tests, and that is exactly why he needs to soak his old bones in a warm bubble bath. I'm thinking he isn't that much older than some of his other castmates. He's just trying to point out that he's the oldest participant of the ten of them. Yeah. So, don't do that to yourself, Michael. Just bask in how much more in shape you are than everyone else. I think he's just being humble. Because he's 39, and he blew through those challenges. Yeah. Chloe asks him what his thoughts are on the retreat. Michael replies, saying he didn't realize how foregone all of these marriages already were, but was hopeful that some of them were secretly working out. He didn't say all of the marriages, he just said some. The truth is, none of these couples are getting along, or along enough for it to be a yes on decision day. I mean, that depends on how long Emily's prescription of drugs is. Oh boy, she does seem to be looking much better next episode. Yes, I'm just convinced that Brennan is just super hot on the idea of this incapable girl that just has to hang on his arm as he biceps her around. Uh, yeah, it's very uncomfortable. Chloe agrees with Michael's assessment. Seeing the status of all these other relationships has reinforced to her that she and Michael will be fine as long as they keep the communication lines honest and open because the other couples weren't being that with one another. To be clear, communication doesn't mean that a couple will stay together because if they're communicating effectively, sometimes that communication just leads them to, oh, I guess we just don't work together. Yeah, and that's fine. You gave it the old college try and you went off to greener pastures. Just don't string it along. Mm -hmm. In her confessional, Chloe says she finds Michael's authentic communication sexy. She extends that even further, saying she likes seeing him shirtless. She goes like this. <laughs> I'm like, where are you looking, Chloe? <laughs> I know she couldn't see anything since obviously there's foam everywhere in the bubble bath. That's probably the case. <laughs> so I'm glad that she's showing signs of being physically attracted to him. Someone who is showing no signs of attraction to his partner at least physically, is Austin. 
It is just the two of them in their own living area of the mansion. They have staged a movie night to talk about what else, how their retreat is going. Becca expresses that she loves being in the company of their friends, but last Friday was a huge disappointment for her. A disappointment because her spouse is full of empty promises where he vows to initiate intimacy, but it never comes to fruition. To procrastinate the deed even further, he apologizes again and hugs her. Again, apologies that don't come with adjustments to what you're doing isn't really an apology. It's okay for Austin to not want to have sex with someone he isn't attracted to.、Mm-hmm. Personally, I think knowing someone within two months. And being compelled to sleep with them is a bit unfair, but I would agree, except for the fact that they came on this show willingly with this expectation. <laughs> sex expectation. Yeah, this sex expectation. <laughs> Was that a no? Okay. This sex expectation.、Um, <laughs> this sex expectation. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Becca just needs to rent a donkey costume or something. <laughs> Oh, I want to make that an animation. <laughs> She's like, "Hey, Austin." <laughs> like, I'm not really interested. Oh yeah. Well, how about you want to play football with a mascot from a football team of donkeys? <laughs> a donkey mascot costume. <sighs> oh yes, I can feel my intimacy growing. <laughs> Seriously, Austin, if you really didn't want these things to be said, you probably shouldn't have revealed that you open mouth kissed a donkey on the same TV show where you don't want to be intimate with your wife. Okay, we're not coming up with these things, and we're not suggesting that they're true. You're suggesting that they're true. <laughs>、uh, Becca continues to cry, saying that the retreat filled her with so many expectations, and now their time here is pretty much over. Austin, who, by the way, is wearing his cap where it's backwards, but it's also not sitting fully on his head, so he kind of looks like Johnny Appleseed from Melody Time, where he's wearing a saucepan as a hat. It's just like <laughs> resting on the top of his hat.、Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought it made him look silly. <laughs> he's already coming off as very childish, so that didn't help with the persona. Anyways, Austin's only remark to Becca's recurring concern is that he's quote happy to talk some more about it, and in his perspective, they've made great strides in the intimacy department.、Mm-hmm. He's convinced that if he keeps talking about it, he'll never actually have to do it. It's working. <laughs> I get the feeling that Austin, like Brennan, just doesn't want to say on camera that he doesn't find his wife attractive. Because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. He doesn't want to have to deal with all of the people calling him shallow. Yeah. And... Because Brennan did that. I think Pastor Cal visited him and Emily, and he asked Brennan, "What's preventing you from getting closer? What do you find in Emily that is holding you back?" And Brennan was, like, "I'm not answering that because if someone said those same things about me, I would be very upset. So I'm not going to do that to her." And I'm like, "You." Kind of said what you needed to say without saying the actual words. Brennan and Austin, all these characters are so hard to keep straight. Yeah, they're kind of in our eyes the same person at the moment. <laughs> Almost all the people on the show are the same person. <laughs> the couple's retreat is finally at an end. Finally. Unlike the time when they were packing to get to this location, Brennan is actually doing favors for his wife. Not only is he holding her hand, he has opted to pack up her stuff without being prompted. Good on you, Brennan. Let's hope that attentiveness continues、mm-hmm. once Emily is back to a hundred. When she's able to talk again. On the contrary, Becca is feeling like her marriage has reached its nadir. Their discussion the night before left her feeling more disconnected from her spouse more than ever. Austin didn't attempt to snuggle with her that night, which made her even more uncomfortable. He tries to explain that her constant rehashing of the same problem is what's turning him off to her. Oh my goodness! Those are the worst. The people that are. Oh man, I'm getting even more turned off by the fact that you keep bringing up the fact that my shit is terrible. <laughs> He likens her behavior to reopening a fresh wound. No, the wound is still open. Yeah, you can't just say I'm sorry and then magically have the wound be healed. In an effort to end the conflict, he flat out says to her, "My apology to you was sincere. You understand where I'm coming from, and I appreciate that." 
I'm not any type of way towards you. That sentence I thought was weird because she doesn't understand where he's coming from. I just found the way he said that to be manipulative. You accept where I'm coming from and I appreciate that of you. It seems that he's trying to shut her up by denying her confusion and stating that she's the opposite. It's kind of like when a company something up and people have to wait for the company to fix it. And so then when they do fix it, they say, thank you for your patience. Even if you weren't patient about it, you can't be, oh, I was impatient. Oh, you're not taking my compliment. Yeah. Thank you for not hating me. No, I do hate you. Don't tell me that I don't hate you. Yeah. He's definitely trying to put words in her mouth. To seal the deal, he makes sure to take her aside, kisses her, and proceeds to stroke her hair. I really hope that he's just being cautious and he is possibly attracted to her. I feel like we'll never know the inner workings of Austin's mind. <laughs> Austin is an enigma. We get to the last segment of the episode. To prove that he wants to build more of a foundation with Becca, Austin has planned a date for the two of them at the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center. Austin planned this? He says that he planned it. Either that or production planned it. Either way, it sounds like a little boy saying, I want to go to the zoo. <laughs> the place they go to is actually pretty cool. I just feel it's a lot more work to plan this midway location excursion than to just go home and, you know. <laughs> I don't think you understand the extent that some people are willing to go to to not have to have sex with a person. <laughs> Their tour guides introduce them to their one-year-old wolf pup, Raven. For some reason, the guide insists that they must let Raven lick their faces to avoid having the young pup feel bad. Mm -hmm. I love kisses from my own dog, but for some reason, I don't think I'd let a wolf lick my face, especially my mouth, which was where the pup kissed Becca. That's just what wolves have to do. They would be extremely upset if they oh. couldn't lick your face. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a, you're part of our pack deal. Yeah. No, that's just something you do. We then get a scene that's reminiscent of the San Diego Zoo tour that Robin and Cody experienced during their honeymoon. Unlike that excursion, which reinforced to Cody that every animal in the world is polygamist in nature, Lindsay, the tour guide, has a different message to share. She tells Becca and Austin that their facility engages in arranged matchmaking for their wolves who do mate for life slash are monogamous. So, sorry, Cody. Not sorry. Anyways, it clearly indicates that Cody is a dumb Once again. <laughs> Lindsay introduces the married couple to one of their bachelor wolves who is just waiting around for a potential mate he's comfortable to be frisky with. Kind of where Austin is. Oh, you don't say. The cap-wearing man chimes in, saying that the animal caretakers here are pretty much the quote-unquote experts of this wildlife refuge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lindsay, who isn't familiar with the show, laughs, saying that Becca and he probably weren't packed into an enclosure such as this one. And I'm thinking... Yeah, they were. <laughs> yeah, their enclosure is called their TV show contract. They can't get out of that. Except... I guess, Orion, and then the one bride from episode one, and Claire and Cameron. <laughs> this season is just different. <laughs> they, yeah, they just don't want to be considered losers. <laughs> the wolf expert gives some hopeful lessons to the struggling couple. Just like humans, not all wolf pairings are obvious. It takes a lot of commitment from the individuals to develop a functioning and interdependent dynamic so that their bond can last the rest of their lives. This is very encouraging to Becca, who now believes the only way forward is to not even think of divorce as an option. She hopes that she can, quote, get out of her head because she wants her marriage to last. End of episode. All of these allusions to sexual animals, <laughs> it's not helping Austin's case. <laughs> yeah, this date backfired if he really was the one that planned it out. I don't know, maybe he's a furry. He needs to wear a suit or something. I'm sorry, he wanted to go specifically talk about wolves having sex? I guess it was the aspect of talking about animal relationships. So give me a summary from what you can remember. <laughs> oh my god. Emily is injured directly because she was wearing a helmet that is not made for ATVs. They go to a football mansion. Orion is a jack. 
Then they go to a ninja play center where Michael displays his physical prowess in the jungle gym. Austin and Becca go to a wildlife sanctuary where they're told that they just need to f already. This show doesn't have stories, it just has scenes. It's painful. Uh, oh! Hey, buddy. Anyway, maybe we should create a poll. Not a poll. Um, you know, they make a big bet where they put in bets for what Austin's sexual hang up is. I think they already are doing that on Reddit. Uh, I think it's furry. <laughs> that, that's my guess. I think he's a furry. <laughs> I think he needs to just come out and say, I'm a furry. Maybe. Becca will acquiesce to that. Yeah, then good. Go for it. She a little freaky. But good. Um, I hope so. so. We won't see you next week, but we will see you two weeks from now because I do have an animation idea from mm -hmm. this recap. Okay. So I am going to take my time to write the script and also create um, a cartoon that goes along with it, but it'll be on the Decision Day recap. Okay, um, so... We will see you in two weeks. Okay. Bye! Bye. <laughs> Alright, did you want to get ice cream now or later? Um...